Before we get into the podcast, let's get through the rigmarole first. Remember, guys, this podcast posts each and every single Wednesday. The first segment of the show, we go through all the Dolphins news you need to know about. The second segment of the show, we go through all the AFC East news you need to know about. The third segment of the show, we go through all the players you need to know about on game day. And the fourth and final segment of the show, we go through the Miami Dolphins fan Q&A. Uh, so, obviously, a large portion of of the uh, the fans on this channel live in Florida um, and I know mo- probably all of you most of you were affected by Hurricane Irma um, in some way or another you know somebody that was affected so if you want to make a donation if you want to give back um, you guys can go to dolphinstalk.com they have set up a GoFundMe you can just donate a dollar uh, anything will help at this point obviously uh, if you live in Florida you probably see the devastation every day uh, especially if you stayed um, so I know it hit everybody hard so if you guys want to make a donation you can uh, you guys can go to uh, dolphinstalk.com uh, and they've set up a GoFundMe there where you can donate even a dollar so uh, let's get into all the Dolphins news you need to know about this first news story is concerning the Miami Dolphins Hard Rock Stadium and their practice facility so obviously there is a rumor going around that the Dolphins would have to practice in West Virginia uh, that they actually have might have to move some other home games because of the damages to the stadium um, and to the practice facility that is not the case uh, the inspections went over well Hard Rock Stadium is totally fine it's intact it's safe uh, for people to obviously go to the games um, and the practice facility is totally fine as well which I thought that that thing was gonna get ripped apart but uh, apparently it's totally fine Um, nothing else is going to uh, you know really hurt the Miami Dolphins schedule obviously having our bye week taken away was enough and even the NFL wouldn't give us our London game back uh, so we could at least play at Hard Rock Stadium so we have a tough um, you know the NFL really jacked up our schedule is my point so uh, yeah Uh, so thank God we don't have to go through anything else like that Uh, second news story uh, Richmond Webb and Zach Thomas are up consider uh, for, up for consideration for the Hall of Fame. Obviously, Zach Thomas and Richmond Webb, if you were fans throughout the '90s and to, you know the early 2000s or throughout the 2000s in general, um, those two were obviously some of the best players on the football team, um, if not the best. Um, obviously, Zach Thomas. Um, one of the best linebackers, in my opinion, in, in NFL history. Um, one of the better late-round picks in NFL history. Um, Richard Webb, obviously, a great offensive lineman for many years. Um, so I hope it's gonna. If they do get in, it's gonna take a while, but they're up for consideration. So that's big news for Dolphins fans. As many Hall of Famers as we can fit into the Hall of Fame, uh, that's you know that's better for us as a franchise. So uh, I would think that you know obviously Jason Taylor, one of the bigger reasons he got in, not just because he's one of the best pass rushers in NFL history, um, but the fact that Tom Brady obviously wrote the letter to the committee of the Hall of Fame. Um, you know that really helped him get in as a first ballot Hall of Famer. So you know I would think that Zach Thomas facing off against uh, Tom Brady and Peyton Manning as much as he did throughout his career especially even in playoffs I mean obviously uh, we beat uh, Peyton Manning in the playoffs with uh, it was Zach Thomas at one point in time so uh, I would think that they would vouch for Zach Thomas so we'll see we'll see I hope hopefully they do because that obviously would help him get in um, there's a loaded linebacker class um, with Patrick Willis and Ray Lewis on the horizon so it's going to be tough for him to get in um, so, uh, that's all the Dolphins news you need to know about. Um, other than uh, one more little little nugget of news, uh, the Dolphins are practicing today in California in the Dallas Cowboys facility, training facility that they have there. So, it's our first practice for an NFL game. Um, I think we, we had one, maybe? No, no, we had two or th- two or two or three, maybe, uh, for the Buccaneers. So, uh, Dolphins fans should get excited because the Chargers game is right around the corner. And I know everybody's getting excited for that. I cannot wait to play the Chargers. And it was awesome that we got to go up there a week early um, to prepare, obviously, going cross-country, basically. Uh, It's tough. Let's get into the AFC East news you need to know about. This first news story is concerning defensive tackle for the Buffalo Bills, Marcel Darius. This report comes from Pro Football Rumors. Defensive tackle Marcel Darius is facing a, quote, make-or-break 2017 season with the Buffalo Bills, according to Ian Rappaport of NFL.com. When he's at the top of his game, Darius is one of the league's better interior defenders, especially against the run. But when he's been arrested, suspended multiple times, failed to condition properly, and just last month was sent home following a Buffalo, the Buffalo Bills' third preseason game following a violation of a team role when asked recently if Darius was a part of the Bills future general manager Brandon Bain was non-committal he said quote I don't know Darius six-year 9.1 or excuse me 95.1 million dollar contract extension 
uh, arranged by Buffalo Bills prior regime, is arguably the most player-friendly deal in the NFL, making it extremely difficult extremely difficult for the Bills to trade or release Darius because he's due $7.3 million in guaranteed 2018 salary. Darius isn't going to be an attractive trade candidate, and Buffalo could only clear cap space next season by um, Darius a post-June 1 cut. Even then, the club would take on nearly $14 million in dead money while clearing just $2.5 million. The Bills, led by Bain and following new decision-maker Sean McDermott, haven't been afraid to deal players that were selected by the team's former front office thus far. Uh, they've, tra- they've traded wide receiver Sammy Watkins and cornerback Ronald Darby, acquiring draft picks in addition to veterans EJ Gaines and Jordan Matthews. Um, I don't think, I mean, this is, I think, I wouldn't expect LaShawn McCoy to be there for much longer, um, even though he's the by far their best player on the team, especially now. Marcel Darius, obviously, you know, he's got, I mean, that whole locker room is weird. He's got question marks. Um, so I wouldn't expect him to be on the roster for too much longer either. Um, you know, I, like they said, nobody's going to trade for him because of his his deal that they it's, it's a terrible deal for anybody to take on, um, and nobody's going to take on that deal, especially with his personality issues that he's having um, off the field. Uh, not personality, just off the field issues. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. He's obviously been one of the better Bills for a long time. Um, and it was a force in Rex Ryan's defense before Sean McDermott got there. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens uh, with that whole situation. Uh, next news story, Bills to sign linebacker Jelani Jenkins. Um, how dare how da- how dare Jelani Jenkins um, go to their AFC East rival? This report comes from Pro Football Rumors. Jelani Jenkins will return to the AFC East after an, unsuc- an unsuccessful for, uh, foray with the Raiders this offseason. The Bills are signing the former Dolphins linebacker, uh, Joe of w, WKBW tweets, uh, the Raiders released Jenkins with an injury uh, settlement earlier this month, and it, lo- it, t- it looks like Buffalo feels confident that the 4-3 outside linebacker has recovered sig- uh, sufficiently from the groin injury that sidelined him. The Bills cut rookie cornerback, uh, rookie cornerback Greg Mabin to make room for him on the roster. A 2013 fourth round pick, Jenkins started for three seasons with the Dolphins, although injuries uh, married his 2016 campaign. Jenkins stood out as a first year uh, starter two years prior to making 110 tackles and registering 3.5 sacks. The Bills did not have much experience on their linebacker core behind starters Lorenzo Alexander, uh, Raymond Humber, carrying fifth and sixth round rookies, Matt Milano, and Tanner of, ooh, I cannot say that last name, as a second stringer. The Raiders signed Jenkins to a one-year, $1 million deal to compete for a starting job on a defense without much linebacker experience. He could secure the outside linebacker, la, excuse me, the outside linebacker position opposite Bruce Irvin and then was released. I don't know why they would ever think he would ever do that. I don't know why they signed Jelani Jenkins. He's not a 3-4 outside linebacker. He's a 4-3. I mean, at best, they could have used him as a 3-4 inside linebacker. That was a terrible decision by the Oakland Raiders. And the Buffalo Bills now have one of the more injury-prone linebackers in the NFL, which is obviously not a good thing because linebackers probably have the most physical job other than the defensive tackle um, on on an NFL defense, constantly going in between the tackles, constantly having to get into the trenches um, and dealing with that. So that's not... Obviously, the most ideal situation for the Buffalo Bills. Um, and we saw on their debut, which we're going to talk about later, um, some some key things there. Um, and especially, I don't know how they're going to... I would have to go look back and look at the defense, uh, watch that game again. But they run a 4-3 defense now in Buffalo. I don't know how in the world they're going to use Lorenzo Alexander. So, we'll see. Um, let's see here. All right, next new story. Uh, two teams inquired... On Jets quarterback Bryce Petty, which is very interesting that anybody would want Bryce Petty. Um, still interesting to me that the Bills have continued to go with Josh McCown, who had not said did, I was pretty. He had a terrible game against the the, uh, the Bills. Um, this report comes from Pro Football Rumors. Two, un- two unidentified teams inquired on Jets quarterback Bryce Petty. P- um, Bryce Petty's availability. Uh, 
excuse me, availability this summer, but we're told New York has no interest in dealing the third-year single caller, according to Ian Rappaport of NFL.com. Uh, Petty, a fourth-round pick uh, in the 2015 draft, started four games for Gangrene a season ago, completing 56% of his passes for 809 yards, three touchdowns, and seven interceptions. The 26-year-old finished dead in DVOA among quarterbacks with fewer than 200 uh, pass attempts and ranked second-to-last in total bo- to, in total quarterback rating among passers with at least four starts. Still, Petty could uh, convincingly be a part of the Jets' long-term plans as he signed for two more, season, two more seasons at cheap rates. His starts in 2016 represented the first action of his NFL career, so his poor results could be chalked up to growing pains, and Petty wasn't blessed with the most talent of uh, offensive weapons and was playing behind an offensive line that ranked just 20th in adjusted sack rate. Jets quarterback Josh McCown is... Uh, notoriously prone to injuries, and given that New York hasn't shown any infiltrate, um, infl- infiltration to uh, to put 2016 second-round pick Christian Hackenberg on the field, Petty could see his start uh, starts again this year. He's inactive today against the Bills, however, as he's presumably still recovering from a grade one MCL sprain sustained during the preseason. So that's a whole bunch of hodgepodge. I like <clears throat> I, I, I honestly don't see one team going after Bryce Petty. Um, He's looked the best out of the three quarterbacks, I can say that, which isn't saying a lot, but yeah, I, I, I really don't see anything uh, happening there, making moves there. By the way, that game, which we're going to talk about here in a second, I keep saying that, but that game was very interesting for a lot of different reasons. Um, the only common theme from last year is that um, LaShawn McCoy is still LaShawn McCoy, um, so, which I don't think anybody had doubts. Next news story, Patriots' Deion Lewis drawing trade interest. This report comes from Pro Football Rumors. Patriots running back Deion Lewis is generating trade interest around the NFL, reports Jeff, ha- uh, Jeff Howe of, Pro- uh, of the Boston Herald. The writer says, quote, multiple squads reached out to the New England Patriots during the offseason, including, quote, as recently as the past week. Uh, so far, the Patriots have been unwilling to discuss the back, although Howe uh, believes that uh, that could change by late October's trade deadline. The writer also knows the New England Patriots aren't shopping Deion Lewis. They have simply just received multiple calls about the running back. Um, so, I, you know, uh, this is very interesting stuff. I, you know, knowing Bill Belichick's history, I would not, I wouldn't doubt that he would trade somebody by the trade deadline just because he's a, obviously he, he loves his trades. But one thing that I've noticed with the New England Patriots uh, that I think is very interesting um, is the their their running back situation is very murky. Murky. Uh, murky. Um, they all three of the running backs are very similar in size and very similar in running styles. To be honest with you, um, they're not big. They're not this big power back that like Garrett Blunt was that really just kind of fits their power running scheme um, that they use to close out games late in games. Um, obviously, Blunt never really you know they love that shotgun draw play, that shotgun zone inside zone uh, type stuff. Um, that they do with James White a lot of the time and Deion Lewis a lot of the time, uh, and we saw that some from Mike Gillisley. But he he mainly all the carries that Mike took were Garrett Blunt's carries that he would have took, which is just the uh, lining up under center power run plays. Um, and I don't think Mike is going to I don't think Mike is as talented as Blunt is in that scheme, um, and I think it's going to hurt him. You know we saw that, um, and I. When we want the Chiefs games is a perfect example of that. In short yardage situations, they really struggled. Um, there was a fourth and one, and they were inside the Chiefs territory, and they just couldn't pick it up because uh, Gillisley's not a big back, and I mean just ta- and just stature alone. Uh, you know, he's not just he's not a big guy like Blunt is. So I think they're going to struggle in short yardage situations this year, and in obvious running downs when they have to get like okay, this is a yard or two yards. They're, I think they're going to struggle a little bit. I think you will see them pass it more than they will run it now. Um, I think it's going to change some of their, uh, how they look at their personnel and change some of the game planning there. Um, so it's going to be interesting. That's just going to be something to watch with their running back group. It's very, it's very weird. I don't think they have it figured out yet. Will they figure it out yet? Will they figure it out throughout the season? Who knows? I would, I mean, I would expect the Patriots to figure it out. But again, when you look at all the running backs down the depth chart with Mike Gillisley, um, James White, Deion Lewis, Rex Burkhead, all of those guys are super similar in how they play football. Other than Mike Gillisley, who's by far the most different, but he's about he's the same size as all of those guys. Um, when you look at James White, he's more of 
a scat back slash he you know he's good at you know he's good at shotgun runs he's good at inside zones um out of the shotgun and draw plays same thing with Deion Lewis um he's a good cutback uh when running those plays and same thing with Rex Burkhead so it's I think they got to figure out how they're going to use these I don't think they figured it out yet so it's gonna be something it's very interesting to watch um it's gonna be very interesting to watch their, their running back room throughout the season all right, let's get let's uh, let's get into uh, the third segment of the show. Where we're going to highlight all the players you need to know about on game day. So the first, I think, the first two uh, that we really, I think, are going to have to really step up, and especially on obvious pa- obvious passing downs um, this upcoming Sunday is Larry Tunsil and Jawan James. Now, obviously, these two faced well, at, well, technically not Laramie, but uh, Brandon did. Um, so this is going to be the first time Laramie do- has. Um, uh, the first time Larry Mee is going to face either, I think, what, he's going to face Melvin. Um, so, uh, I think this is his first start at, at tackle, too, in the NFL, uh, as an official starter, obviously, at tackle. Um, and obviously, Juwan James um, is going to have to have a big game, too. But both of those guys on obvious pass and downs have to play up to their talent, especially, I, I, I don't, I'm not really worried about Larry Mee. I, Larry Mee is, a, is going to be a dominant force this upcoming season. Um, you know, I, I can't wait to watch him play tackle. It's going to be so fun watching him pull and stuff uh, and get out and run out in the open field with his athleticism. Very similar to Tyron Smith, man. Very, very similar. And if you watch Tyron Smith play, um, that man is one of the more dominant players I've ever seen. So um, it's going to be fun to watch Laramie this upcoming or this season. Um, so he's going to have to have a, a really good game of pass protection, and so is um, and so is uh, is Juwan. And I hope Juwan is on his on his game this game because we need him we can't have him struggle in this game and I don't think he will I think he grew a lot last year I've talked about this before but I think Juwan grew a lot last year I think he's improved his game so much um, from his his early years in Miami and he's always been a super talented guy Um, he's always always been a super talented player but he just had to put it together with technique and consistency and work at all that stupid stuff that you hear people talk about Um, that's some those you said to you know, just put it all together, and he finally did last year, and he was amazing. Um, and you know, I keep bringing up this quote that William Hayes had um, when he got to Miami. He said, um, "Those two have the chance. Those two have a chance to be the best uh, tackle duo in the NFL." Um, so, those two are gonna—they're gonna have to play up to their potential this um, this upcoming Sunday um, for us to really have success on third down, obvious passing situations, goal line situations when we pass the football to really get Joey Bosa and Melvin Gordon off of our quarterbacks back and Jay Cutler, um, make make his day a little bit easier. Um, and it's got to be a comforting thing, especially throughout uh, J- Jay's career. He's never had two tackles like this. He's never had somebody of Laramie's caliber to protect his blind side and both sides, both bookends. He's never had that. So uh, his pass, the pass, this pass protection, if they can stay healthy, should be the best that um, uh, the best that Jay has ever had, especially on the outside there. Um, so those two are going to have to have uh, play up to their potential, have to have a good game for us to have success in the passing game, um, and I would expect they would. Um, some other guys that need to have who who need to be highlighted and could be more involved than more than people think, especially knowing Adam, is um is Jakeem Grant. I think everybody's excited to watch Jakeem Grant what he'll do on Sunday because he's coming off of a great game in preseason and he in the last really two games he's been dominating the competition. Obviously that's lower competition, um, but ever since we moved him to the outside he has been a totally different player, just a totally different player. So him going up against the San Diego Chargers, I think he's going to get a lot of looks, a lot of, um, a lot of situations where he could, uh, a lot of uh, situations where he could be used, whether that's on the goal line, on end rounds, faking end rounds, taking end rounds, um, which we saw some of last year, um, and a lot of deep shots. And I don't think you know with all the players that the Chargers have to game plan for. Um, I think they're going to forget about Jakeem Grant. I, I think he can have a really, really, really good game. He's going to get a lot of one-on-one matchups, and you can't do that with Jakeem, obviously, because of his speed. Um, if he doesn't have a safety help over the top, uh, or even on a slant if he doesn't have safety help, just stuff like that, Jakeem can really hurt your, your defense. So I would look for Jakeem to have a sneakily good game. Not, I'm not saying like he's going to have 110 yards off of four catches or something crazy like that. Maybe 50 yards gets a couple plays in, uh, busts the screen open, something like that. Just I think Jakeem Grant has a chance to have a very successful game um, this upcoming uh, and Sunday. Another player to really look at 
is really pick your pick the one that you want. I'm going to go with Kenyon over Damian. But last year, what we saw with the San Diego Chargers, or excuse me, well, they were the San Diego Chargers last year, but the LA Chargers now, um, is we really took advantage of the matchups with our lineback with their linebackers on our running backs, um, which obviously Adam loves running, um, getting those matchups with linebackers on running backs. Um, and Damian Williams, obviously, with that clutch third and three, I think, touchdown grab. Uh, from Ryan Tannehill. I would expect to see more of that this upcoming game. Their linebacker unit is extremely, extremely, it's just injured. I mean, their three starters right now are Kyle Emanuel, and he's more of a tweener guy. He's more of a pass rusher than he is a coverage linebacker. Um, Corey Toomer, who's been around the league a while. Um, and then you have by far the best left on the team is Jatavis Brown, who had a good, who had a good season last year. So there are opportunities there for Kenyon Drake to really – to really get going on some of those uh, obviously he's a tremendous route runner and it's something he did really well at Alabama and that's something he did well um, when he came to Miami he just needed to understand the playbook a little bit more I think you're going to see some more of K- Kenyon Drake as well on the offensive side of the football so um, those two can really damage the Chargers as a defense because it's, again you game plan you game plan for first and foremost JHI. then you got a game plan for Jarvis Landry um, and then you got a game plan for some of the other skill position players like Kenny Stills and Devontae. So some of those guys can get lost in the fold. Um, and you can forget about some of those guys. And same thing with Leontay Crew. But I think Jakeem has a chance to really uh, do something special in this game. And, and so does Kenyon. So I would look for those two to have sneakily good games. Because they could, again, you got a game plan for all those people. Those guys can get lost in the fold. Um, and on defense, uh, man, there, there's there's a lot of players I can't wait to watch. Um, I would expect one player I really want to highlight is Lawrence Timmons. Um, he needs to have a great game. Melvin Gordon, um, to take some of the load off of Phillip Rivers, is going to be heavily involved throughout the season. If any indication of that Broncos game is what the how the Chargers are going to use him, he is going to be the focal point of the San Diego Char- or the LA Chargers offense for the rest of the season. So we have to do everything we can to stop them. And one of the ways we can do that is for Lawrence Timmons to have a really good football game. Same thing with Kiko, but um, he can. We need both of those guys to fly around the football but um the reason i'm highlighting lawrence timmons in particular is because he can affect the game in many different ways um he can rush the passer at a very high level and obviously he can get involved and dominate just absolutely dominating the tackle box um and he was obviously he's a very instinctual linebacker throughout his career he's put up good interception numbers because of his instincts he's always in the right place at the right time um, and he's got, like I said, he's got great instincts. So those are some of the ways he can just affect a football game. He can do it in many different ways. Not only that, um, but he looked amazing in preseason. I mean, absolutely amazing. I don't know if it's just because he's in a Dolphins uniform. I don't know what it is, but the man looked 100%. He just looked different. Maybe I'm crazy. Tell me if I'm crazy. But he looked faster. He looked more athletic. Um, it looked like he lost a lot of weight. Not a lot of weight, but he, lo- he definitely looked like he thinned out. Um, a lot from last year and he just looked more he just looked faster and more athletic especially in the receiving game he was flying around obviously we saw him get an interception in preseason which was just absolutely a snag um, so I, I I think Lawrence Timmons can have a really 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 good game this upcoming uh, this game this, he he, need, he doesn't need to have one but I would expect him to have one um, you know obviously he's got some weeks of rest um, and I would expect him to be flying around out there. But he can affect the game, like I said. He can affect the game in many different ways. I would look for him to get after Phillip Rivers on third down, which he excels at. Throughout his career, he's been a dominant um, blitzing linebacker. Um, he was obviously a part of Blitzburg when Dick LeBeau was down there as a younger player. Um, and that's one of the reasons they drafted him, because of his uh, because of his ability to rush the passer. So, and we saw that in preseason. He was getting, I think, what he got. I know he got a pressure. He got a couple pressures on Carson Wentz, but I think he got a sack as well. So, um, so Lawrence Timmons can affect, like I said, can affect the game in many different ways, and I would expect him to, to really um, to be a game breaker in this game, um, uh, especially with all the talent that we have up front. You kind of tend to forget about all Lawrence Timmons back there. Um, so those are de- those are some of the players that are definitely um, can affect the game, and probably the Chargers aren't paying too close attention to, especially Jakeem Grant, Kenny Drake, um, and especially Jakeem Grant, who I think can really have a game, like a game-breaking type of, and like I said, he doesn't have to have ridiculous numbers, but he can just make a couple plays here and there that can really change the momentum of the football game, uh, because you forget about him. 
Uh, like I said, you forget about him with all the other talent on the football uh, uh, on the on the football field. So uh, some other players on the defensive side of the football that I want to see have a really good game, uh, who I think that uh, would obviously they need to have a really good game um, is Xavier Howard. Um, this is his first. Uh, obviously, coming off the injury, he's much improved. He looks like he's much improved from a year ago. He looked great in the preseason. Um, he looked amazing. I thought I thought he looked. Uh, you know, the first preseason game, it was like, what's going on here? And then the rest of the preseason, he was locked down. So, um, I think Xavier Howard is going to have a great season. Um, I've said it multiple times. I think he has Pro Bowl talent, and I think he could make a Pro Bowl anytime in the near future. So. Um, Xavier Howard, I would look forward to have a really good game this upcoming season. I think, you know, obviously he's going to be matching up probably more with Tyrell Williams than anybody else. Um, I would say Dontrell Inman would be a good candidate there as well. Um, I don't Keenan Allen's a little iffy. I, maybe if Keenan lines up on the outside more, I don't know. I, I would have to go like I would have to go back and look at some of the. Um, I, I know in preseason he lined up in the slot a whole lot more than he did the outside, but I would have to go back and look at the Broncos game to, to see where to definitively say where he's he lined up more. Uh, but I would expect Xavier to be on more of the outside guys like Ty- Tyrell Williams and uh, and uh, Dontrell Inman. So uh, Xavier, I would obviously and obviously the obvious one is Rashad Jones. I mean we we've been waiting to you know obviously Rashad's coming back finally. He's a he's just an I mean. Uh, he's just a really fun player to watch. Um, he's always been a really fun player to watch. He's ath- he's just a supreme athlete. He's flying around at the football. He's making crazy plays in the backfield. He's obviously going to be a factor um, in this game, and I would expect him to be very active. Um, obviously, Rashad loves to play coverage closer to the line of scrimmage, um, not as deep. Obviously, he likes playing strong more than he does three. Um, so I would expect him to get involved in some of those passing lanes as well if, on third down, um, and that should help out our, our defense. Like I said, they're going to do a lot of deep cross. When I previewed this game um, in my previous video, I, I said they're going to do a lot of deep crossing routes because that's what they did to our defense last year because we stopped, we struggled to stop stuff in the mobile football field. That's going to be no different. They're going to do the same thing in this game. But I think Rashad Jones being closer to the line, um, really being able to look at Philip Rivers' eyes, um, and just, you know, I think he's going to ha- have some have some, have some big plays in this game. Um, and he always does against the Chargers, so I would expect him, especially if we get pressure on the on the quarterback. With we send t- Tim is on a dude, it, we have so many people that can be sent on a blitz. It's going to be hard um, to check for pass protection in this game. Even that, even though Phillips obviously he's seen it all, it's going to be interesting to watch um, what Matt Burke dials up with all the versatility on the defense. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, I hit my mic. Um, Rashad Jones definitely a player, uh, definitely a player to to uh, to watch there. Um, and Will Hayes, Will Hayes needs to have a really really good game, um, especially in the running game to really contain the running game. You know, hit him in the backfield, make some play, which he will, because Will Hayes always does. You watch every game the man's ever played, he's always making plays in the backfield. So those plays will be there. Our defense needs to take advantage of those plays on third and long situations. Last time we played the Chargers, we didn't take advantage of the third and thirteens, third and fifteen. Even third and seventeens, we did not take advantage of it. So we need to take advantage of it in this game. If we get them in third and long, capitalize on it. Get off the football field on third and longs as a defense. Um, we have to make those plays. And no boneheaded plays. Last last time we played them, we, we there was a lot. Granted, there was a ton of young players playing in that game. A ton, like a ton of young players. So that I guess that I guess that's normal. Uh, but. We had a lot of uh, defensive holding calls in that game and a lot of stupid penalties, so hopefully we can minimize those as well. But I, th- I would expect William Hayes, like I said, throughout his career, um, has been a beast at just penetrating into the backfield and really wreaking havoc, wreaking havoc in the running game. So he's going to be a very... Uh, a very uh, uh, he's going he's gonna to make a lot of plays in this game. I really, I really do believe that. Um, and the last one, last but not least, uh, for my players to highlight, is Devon Gotcha. Um who I think this is obviously his first start as a rookie. Um, it's gonna, it's a big deal. I can't wait to watch him uh, play. I had a tremendous preseason, um, and I can't wait to see him build off of that in the regular season game. And this is the best f- so far out of everybody that I've seen play next to Sue in Miami. Th- he, I think he has the chance to be the best one, and I think he is the best one. And that's a little early to say. But from what I've seen throughout preseason, if he can continue to play at that level, and he was not only was he playing at that level, but he was consistent, which is a very key thing. If he can continue to do that, um, the interior of our defensive line is going to be so drastically different from a year ago that I don't know what teams are like. 
not to sound ridiculous because I think that sounds a little ridiculous, but um, it's going to be tough for team. I think our run defense is going to be much improved this year um, if Devon Gotchuk could continue to be consistent against the run game because I have no doubts in the passing game what he can do. He's always been a tremendous pass rusher and even in the SEC. So um, we saw a lot of that in preseason as well. So that that's been a common theme. Um, so I think, you know, it's going to be really fun to watch that interior of the defensive line because, again, Sue has not played with somebody of Devon's caliber yet, um, and hopefully I'm right about that, and I think I, I, I would like to think I am. Um, and that's going to be fun to watch. It's going to be really, really fun to watch. I can't wait to see what Devon Gotcha does in his first uh, his first NFL game. I think he's going to – I think he has a chance to really, again, previewing this game, the, the video that I did, he's going to have a lot of one-on-ones. Uh, hopefully he can take advantage of that, and I think he can with his talent. So he's going to be really fun to watch. Um, next is – wait. Oh, okay. So we're going to do our rookie rankings. They haven't changed. Obviously, we haven't been able to play an NFL game. So if you if you don't remember my rookie rankings so far – and remember, guys, leave them down in the comment section below to leave your rookie rankings too. I would love to see them. Um, is one right now I have Devon Gotcha. Two, I have Cordia Tankersley. Three, I have Charles Harris. Um, that's because of – Preseason performance, I think that Cordrea um, and Devon had the most consistent and most uh, the best performances in um, in, uh, bleh, in preseason. Uh, so it's not that it's again it's not a knock on Charles Harris because I think all three of them had a good preseason, but I think Cordrea and and uh, Devon were able to really set themselves apart there. Uh, all right, so let's get into the Dolphins fan Q and A. Um, we're really m- moving through this fast. Uh, it's because we didn't have a lot of news to talk about, and this is what happens when you know you get a game postponed. For God's sake, I can't—I still can't believe that, that uh, they didn't—they didn't move the London game back. It's, that's absolutely ridiculous. I think the reasoning behind it was it would cost too much money. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The amount of money that we—the Dolphins, any NFL team really—it doesn't matter who you are—makes for the NFL a year is insane alone. Just like one franchise, not even a bunch of franchises. It's insane. It costs too much money. That, I, that, that that almost made me punch my TV, or my not my TV, but whatever I saw that, whatever screen I saw that on, um, made me want to punch it because it was it, it was just it's, it's such a stupid reason. But anyway, let's get into the Miami Dolphins fan Q and A. Uh, uh, this first question comes from No, this is Patrick, and it's, it starts off with a with a good one. He says, "Will Irma kill me?" Well, thank God it didn't get you. I think No, this is Patrick. Hopefully, it didn't. Hopefully, you didn't. Um, all right, let's see here. Um, let's see, uh, uh, this first question comes from DMAC12151, says, will the Dolphins be at a disadvantage starting the season later than the rest of the league? No. Um, at any, if anything, they're going to be well, more well rested than the rest of the league. Um, obviously, the only, well, the only disadvantage to that is all the other NFL teams, they got the first game out of the way, which is so important in the NFL. People really underestimate the team that you saw... Any team doesn't matter what team you want to point. That is not what they're going to look at like look like for the rest of the year, um, at all. That is, they have not really, unless some teams have. Some teams know what they want to be. Some teams don't. Um, thankfully, we actually have an identity, so that's that's a good thing. Um, but usually, it's not. That's not the team. Uh, that's not what. That's not at. The, that's not what the team is going to be at their best. That's not what the best. Um, team or whatever franchise you're talking about is going to look like. Um, so I don't think we're going to be at a disadvantage going into this game because the Chargers got to play before us. Um, we should be totally fine. We should be fine with the, with the week's full rest. I know we, we have so many young players on this team that they're so ready to just play that first game. I think they're going to be ready to go. I think they're going to be fine. Um, uh, Psalm guy says, uh, what would Marino's stats have actually looked like today? You mentioned, you mentioned it in a recent vid, but is there a way you could analyze the stats of all starting quarterbacks versus those in his, in his area and right and right uh, and arrive at a percentage to increase each of the, the relevant stats? You could do that. Um, and I've often thought about doing that for a while. Um, I've done it in like, I've done it by myself. I can't, I can't, you know, when you look at, I, the one player that comes to mind when comparing modern stats to um, modern stats to uh, 80s or whatever era, or late 70s, uh, throughout the 80s and throughout the 90s, uh, is John Elway. Um, when you look at, well, John didn't play in the late 70s, but he played in the early 80s, um, throughout the 80s and throughout the 90s, obviously. But uh, John, 
Uh, when you look at John's stats, they are not Hall of Fame level at all. They don't they don't even compare to Dan's. Like Dan's are so much better than John's. Um, it's just John had he had a really he had two really good football teams at the tail end of his career that carried. He obviously contributed a great deal to those teams. I'm not saying they carried him, but they were very 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 similar to what Peyton Manning um, had in his last year as as a pro. Um, but when you look at the, his stats, they're very pedestrian, and some of it it's it's, just, it's I, I don't have them in front of me, but there was a lot of years where he threw way more interceptions than he did touchdowns. I think he only passed for over 25 touchdowns once in his career. Comparing that to Ryan Tannehill, if, if seriously, if you can like this is the difference between eras. If you compare Tannehill stats to Elway's, you would be you would think like why do people think of Elway at this level? Like you know, like why do people think Elway is this like mystic being or one of the better quarterbacks in NFL history? Because his stats don't. When you look at the stats, you would think is this Ryan Fitzpatrick or something like that? Uh, they're not that bad, but they're they're not Hall of Fame level. Like if you looked at Kurt Warner's stats, they're just they're way better than Elway's stats. Um, Elway never came close to Marino's MVP year or Kurt's MVP year or any MVP year really. So you have a really good point. When you compare, um, like even Andy Dalton has better stats than. Like yardage wise, he has way better stats than Elway ever did. Um, touchdown interception ratio. I think I don't think Elway like I think Andy's career year is better than John's career year. So you're right. If Marino played today, um, he would be something like Drew Brees. I would think like every year passing for over five thousand yards. Same similar to Matt Stafford. Every year passing for over five thousand yards. I would his MVP year. In the, like let's say Dan had his MVP year this year, right? Th- that would be well over 50 touchdowns, some crazy yard, crazy yardage number, especially with Don Shula coaching. And Don was so good at taking advantage of uh, the 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 NFL's rules at that particular time. And that's one of the reasons that Dan had so much success early on in his career is because he saw he saw the talent level in Dan and he adjusted the offense to that. Um, and really evolved because he took advantage and really revolutionized the NFL. So, um, yeah, his, his stats would be insane. Uh, Ken Anderson says, Skaggs, Skaggs, you know I've been a fan for a while, and I remember you saying in the Buffalo, Bill game, uh, Biff Buffalo Bills game uh, review that you should start doing live reactions. Are you going to do something like that this year, like react to game highlights? I wouldn't think I would. Uh, it's very hard. Um, to do, and I know this isn't a Dolphins question, so I'll answer this quick, quickly. But no, I, I would think that's um, very unlikely, and it's it's sad. I you know I want to do live reactions in some capacity. I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I keep your eye. I'm gonna I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to. I'm working on that. I'll say it. I'll say I'm working on that. But I definitely want to do that this year. Uh, the gamer one two three four five says, "How can we prepare for the Ravens defense uh, later this year after seeing how the Ravens made Andy Dalton look?" Okay, first of all, here's the deal. Our roster is actually built right. Theirs is not. Their offensive line is is so bad. It's it almost hurts to watch. Like I watched that game, guys, and I I regret it. I watched the entire first half of that game. Why did I watch the entire first half of that game? I don't know. I just wanted to see John Ross. He barely got any snaps. It was fun to see Tyler Boyd get some plays because I liked him coming out of college, but you know, I don't know. It it was just bad. Like their offensive line is is really bad. It's really really bad. It's probably the it, ranking the worst. It's them and Jets tied for last, I guess, because their offensive line is garbage. Um, our offensive line is it's like a night and day. One thing that I will say about the the Ravens, and I don't know the severity of the injury, but they Zadarius Smith got hurt in that game. He is a very underrated player, very underrated, and I think he was set to have a career year this year. If they lose him for a lot of time, that defensive front lost a lot of talent on it uh, if they lose Zadarius Smith. Um, so some of the things that I saw, that the Ra- even though the Bengals' offensive line is atrocious, they were able to run the football in the middle, like up the middle, which was really interesting. Joe Mick- And again, I w- and another reason I watched this is because of Joe Mixon. He had a couple plays there and here and there, but... D- the def- their Ravens defense is really good. Their secondary, not their corners, but their the back end with Eric Weddle and Tony Jefferson, it's amazing. Uh, their corners are kind of weak with Jimmy Smith, Brandon Carr. Um, Jimmy Smith is he's probably the best corner on the team, but they have some question marks there. Um, when they actually face a, a roster that's built right, well, with you know from the line out, which is what you should do, um, it's gonna 
I will be will be interesting to see that. But yeah, I I think I think our offense is going to perform way better than. And, and again, Andy had three red zone turnovers. The, I'm pretty sure the final score was like what twenty to nothing or twenty three to nothing. So think about that. So they could have potentially had three touchdowns, but Andy don't turned it over. Like that's not. I would hope to God Jay Cutler doesn't do that. Have five turnovers in a game. You know what I'm saying. So I, I think it's just it's it's like night and day with our teams. We're no we're nothing like that that football team. Uh, the Dill Pickle says, "How does this team recover from losing its bye?" Okay, I answered that in the fan Q and A, but I'll answer it again. How does this team recover from losing its bye week? What can we do to make this not as bad? I have an update on this. A- Adam Gay said something. I can't remember. You guys will have to tell me down in the comment section below. But it was very interesting, and it's similar to the pitch count idea that uh, Ronald had, and that I and then I talked about in the previous video so i would keep your eye on on that um the gamer one two three four five says what's the key to stopping the chargers very stacked receiver core ah. um i think what makes a receiver so their receiver core so deadly is because of the versatility on it not be not be per, not because they have one guy that's okay you can just wreck a game plan not that they don't have a guy that could potentially do that with uh, with keenan allen but when you look at their receiver core and their depth chart, they have Travis Benjamin. He's a burner, right? Dontrell Inman, very physical outside receiver, big dude. Uh, and he really, uh, Philip really loves those timing routes with him, like those back shoulder fades and stuff. Tyrell Williams, at super athletic, six foot five. People don't know that about Tyrell, but he's super athletic, six five. So he's a physical specimen. Uh, he's a great route runner, too. Um, and then we look at Keenan. Like, I think I already said Keenan, but um, he's a shifty slot receiver-esque route runner uh, so they have a lot of versatility so i think that's the problem with stopping the receiver core is they're just they, they have a lot of different flavors um on their receiver core um the gamer one two three four five says if byron maxwell continues to how can we stop it i forgot okay um i think playing a lot of man um and really if because they're not the first thing they're going to do is try to run the football so if we run if we stuff the run and get them in third and longs. We can we can on uh, uh, we can neutralize the 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 receiver core. Just really take the passing game away. The gamer one two three four five says if Byron Maxwell continue because then our pass rush can get after their. Just let me elaborate that on a little bit. But their their pass our pass rush can get after the the quarterback more if we can do that. And give him less time to throw. And I think what coverage we should play is man. Especially on third and long. The gamer one two three four five says, if Byron Maxwell continues to look bad, should we trade for Kyle Fuller? Oh man, uh, I don't think you know. People underestimate how how good he was at the tail end of the season last year. I don't have the the exact stats in front of me, but he was pretty tremendous in how many yards he let up per snap. It was definitely something like zero point. I can't remember, but it was something really really good. I would say give Byron time. I would say give Byron time, and if he continues to play like he doesn't care then we're gonna have to do something about that and he can't do that because we have talent behind him Cordrea had a tremendous preseason so that the, the rook is coming for any kind of spot that he can he can get uh ronald says uh i answered that the question the fan q and age basically saying what should we do about mac mike pouncey uh the gamer one two three four five says i heard the patriots are shopping Dion lewis would he be worth making a deal for um we talked about that. No, I think our running back core is very talented, and I think it's already stacked, uh, as is. Um, the gamer one two three four five says, "What do you think our top five current NFL? Who are the top five current NFL running backs?" Mm. The AFC in particular has a lot of great ones. So does the NFC, but the AFC has probably more, more of them. Um, man, after watching Week One, man. Um, I would say David Johnson has always been my one. He still is. I would say Le'Veon is my two. I would say three is Zeke. Mm, man, that's hard. Three, I'm going to say is Zeke. Four, I'll say is Jay. And five, I'll say is Shady. That's my current rankings right now. And I so badly wanted to put Jay in the top three, but... If Le'Veon Bell continues to play like he is, like he played in that Cleveland Browns game, was basically non-existent, then Jay is definitely going to move up. But that's my top five. 
The gamer one two three four. The gamer one two three four five says my top five O lines in the NFL: Pittsburgh, Dallas, Miami, Tennessee, Atlanta. Do you agree? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good O line or your top five O lines. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything. Well, the Raiders I would put in there. I would probably take out um, Atlanta and put Oakland in there. Uh, I think Oakland is definitely more talented than Atlanta's offensive line. In which I think Atlanta's offensive line, it's good, but it's a little overrated. Uh, Cody says, how do you feel about the Dolphins playing 16 games straight? Um, uh, yeah, I feel terrible. It's, it's, it's a terrible situation to be in. It's not a good thing for... It's inhumane, to be honest with you. Um, it's not... It's not okay. It's not okay. And I'm surprised more people aren't, like, outright... Like, I don't know. It's, it's weird. Ronald says, how do you think that the team responds with so much downtime and very little practice time? As you're just in the fan Q&A, I think you're going to respond. I think they're so eager to play football at this point, and everything that's went on with Florida and Irma, they're just ready to get out there and, and ball for 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 uh, fans in Florida, um, and they seem pretty jacked about it. And I can't wait to to see how they they come out on Sunday. I think they're going to come out with a lot of emotion and a lot of energy. Gamer Rifix says, "How is Miami? How is Miami Dolphins ballers? Yay! Every day we light. I I don't know what that means." Uh, Adele or not Adele? I can't. I can't. I cannot remember how to say his name. But he says, uh, "All right, I answer that in uh, the fan Q and A." He said, "How good is our defense in terms of defense?" Yeah, I answer that in the fan Q and A too. Um, let's see here. Any more questions? Okay, Mad Gamer says, "Will we have a chance to win the division because of the Patriots against the Chiefs?" Um, that obviously that was a big loss, but uh, you know. Uh, we got to be near dang perfect. We can't, obviously, that's going to be a big loss when it comes to seeding. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, like, I, you know, I told my brother after they lost, he said, I said, yeah, so much for going undefeated. <laughs> because, you know, obviously this team, I didn't think, I don't, I honestly, and you guys can go back and look at, like, I don't know where you would find it, but I have said this many times. This team is not as talented as last year's team, and I will continue to say that because it's not. So, I don't know why they thought this team was going to go undefeated. Just because you see, like, oh, Brandon Cooks and, uh, re- like, who, like, Br- they made a big deal of Coney Ely and he got cut. Nobody's, like, talking about that. They made a big deal of Dwayne Allen. Like, come on, dude. Andrew Luck was his quarterback. That's not, I mean, Andrew Luck was his quarterback. That's not a, that's not a bad, like, that's not, it's not like Geno Smith was his quarterback. I don't know. I could rant about that all day. Um... Uh, Man Gamer says, "Will our secondary be affected with Lippet? Because, in my opinion, Lippet was our best corner. No, I, I, I mean, obviously you're gonna lose something when you lose somebody like that because he's a very talented guy, and you will lose something. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I think we're fortunate enough to have the people that we have behind him with Cordrea and Tori uh, and Altron Werner. Um, Man Gamer says, uh, "Will Char- Charles have six sacks or more? If you're talking about the entire season, I think he'll have more than that. I'm gonna say ten. And I've said that. I said that when we drafted him. He's getting ten, and I I stick by that. Uh, Man Gamer says, "Will Jakeem be the starter or Stills? No, still, Stills. I answered that. Thank you. No, Stills will definitely be the starter." Man Gamer says, "Will JJ be a top five leading rusher this year, or in touchdowns?" Um, I would definitely expect him to be a top five leading rusher and in touchdowns. Ryan says, "How do you feel about um, how do you feel now that we don't have a bye week before playing the uh, the, the Pats of Gillette?" Listen, man, there's nothing we can do about that. And as much as I would not rather than have that not have that happen, um, we play wait we play the um, Buccaneers then the Panthers, right? So we so I mean it's still tough, but um, I I don't know. Bring them on! I can't wait for it. Uh, man, get, and I can't wait to see what Adam does with that. I, I honestly think he's going to do that pitch count thing. I heard something about that. I would have to go look b- back and read about the article, but yeah, I would something like that's going to happen. Mad Gamer says, "How do you feel about the Dolphins not having a bye week?" I feel terrible about it. Um, who most likely is going to have the most touchdowns this year, and who will be the defensive MVP on the Miami Dolphins? That question comes from, by the way, Forty uh, Niners. Uh, um. Or Niners. I am Prez, Prez and Niners. Uh, who will, who will likely go? Who is likely going to have the most touchdowns this year, and who will be the defensive MVP? Um, the most touchdowns. I'm gonna say Jay Cutler, 
because obviously he's the quarterback. So that's a kind of a cop out answer. But other than Jay Cutler, it's between Devontae and Jay. Um, man, I'm gonna say Jay, but I think Devontae is gonna be close. And who will be the defensive MVP? I'm going out on a limb here. You guys can crucify me for it or not. I don't care. But I'm going out on a limb here, and I'm gonna. I'm not. It's not even a limb. It's like a. It's a, like it's like a nice, well built, professionally built, like what do they call those? Like those just like Indiana Jones bridge thing that he was like swinging on in the Temple of Doom, like that. Um, I'm gonna go with um, Xavier Howard for my defensive MVP. Um, let's see here. Well, you know what? Sue's a good one, too. I said Sue was going to be the defensive MVP earlier. It's between Sue or Howard, man. God. I think Sue's going to have his best year of his career, though, so probably Sue. Uh, but Howard's going to be in the mix. Uh, TR3 M- dot, or TR3 MC, excuse me. Uh, TR3 MC, I don't know what that means. He says, if Jay Cutler performs well this season and the Dolphins make the playoffs, do you think Jay... On, is on as the starter and drafting a quarterback to replace Tannehill, 23rd, uh, uh, 23rd Hill is the best direction the Dolphins should go. I love Tannehill. Uh, I am a high on Tannehill. I think he is a franchise quarterback, and I think the Dol- like this is my opinion. Um, I think the Dolphins would be stupid to let him go. I honestly do believe that, and I do think he has the potential to win championships with his talent. That's just my opinion, and I, I, I've i watched him his entire career. I honestly believe that. If you think about the sum of the teams this man's had to deal with, he's never had a team. Like, the team that he had last year, obviously Adam Gase did a fabulous job with the football team, but Tannehill was a huge part of the reason we went to the playoffs, if not the biggest, because obviously with the five um, come-from-behind uh, fourth-quarter comebacks and him, ha- you know, and he just, I mean, obviously in the beginning of the year he didn't look he looked, he looked like, the entire offense really was just not, they were discombobulated, they didn't know what they were doing, but I love Tannehill is the point, and, um, I, it, that is such a tough question to answer, I think either way, let's say Jay Cutler balls out, let's say we keep Tannehill, I think either way you have to draft somebody, um, especially with a loaded quarterback draft, for a lot of different reasons, for him to be a really good backup, for him to be trade bait potentially, and and I don't want to really say this, but Matt Moore is obviously an expensive piece. So I would I think either way you draft a quarterback in this upcoming draft, but it, it's, I would keep Tannehill. So even if Jay did perform outstanding, I would keep Tannehill. Notice Patrick says how bad is um uh, let's see here. Notice Patrick says how bad is it that we won't get a late season buy? It's pretty pretty terrible. Um, Notice Patrick says, will Miami's schedule be further affected by Irma? Thank God it won't. So obviously that was the first story of the day, and it will not. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, Dork- Dorcas says, my name is Magnus. Oh, okay. Um, oh, hang on. Uh, my name is Magnus. Thanks for reading my question last time. He says, what do you think about the next few weeks of no home games? What are the chances of winning? Um, I feel pretty confident in our football team this year. I think um, we're, we're going to be fine. I think what we got the... So is it... Dude, I still don't know. Hang on a second. Let me look up the schedule. As I stall here. So we have... I know that we play... Um, obviously, I, I know the schedule like my back of my hand. But we play the... the um, we Chargers to this week. Next week... So we do go on the road to MetLife, right? Let me look that up real quick. Do we go on the road to MetLife, or do we stay at, do we go back home? I think, so our home opener will be against, technically, which it's not a home opener, um, um, against, man, I can't, hold on, I'm spacing out, against the Saints, right? So, if, if, so if we do open, I think we'll be fine. Uh, obviously the Jets, no offense to the Jets, but their team is not very, they're trying to lose, they're tanking. Uh, so that should not be an issue. Hopefully, dude, it better not be an issue. I'll tell you that right now. Um, uh, we should we should be totally fine. Uh, we should be fine. It's gonna be tough on the players, but it, we should be fine. As I'm, I, I'm just basically stalling right now to look at the schedule so I don't get it wrong. Uh, let me see here. All right, hang on. All right, yeah. So yes, we are at MetLife Stadium. 
So we so we get like like I said we so we're, we're with our home technically our home opener is against the Saints which it's not because we have to go on Lon to to London, then we go to Tennessee that's at home thank God that's at home, so that's our home opener is week five technically right yeah week five against the Titans, and then we go on the road again and then we're back at home against the Jets so, the Dolphins are definitely going to be a road show for the first few weeks of the season but I think we'll I think we'll be fine I think we'll be totally fine. And obviously, the AFC East is very interesting this year. Super interesting. You know, some of the things that I'm gonna, we're going to talk about uh, in the AFC East, the state of the AFC East, which is tomorrow, is what we saw from the Buffalo Bills and the Jets. Um, the Bills that I, what I wanted to see, to see is how they utilize um, Tyra Taylor, and it was very vanilla. It was not as creative as it was last year. So if that's any indication of how they're going to consistently use him, which I would, which why I would assume is, um, he lined up a, a lot under center. Obviously, naturally in the NFL today, you're going to line up in shotgun quite a few times, but not a lot of pistol, not a lot of triple option that I saw. Maybe I have to get, I have to go look at, it, but it's definitely not as creative as it was last year. I can definitively definitively say that. The only common thread with the Buffalo Bills is uh, that the running game with Shady is still Shady is still Shady, and Shady will always be Shady. Um, that's yeah. So, so that was the only thing that was consistent from last year. Some other things that I saw. The receiving core, not the receiver core, the secondary for the Bills is not as good as it was last year. Uh, Micah Hyde is definitely, uh, ba he's back there. But their corners are not as good, even though they drafted Davis White out of LSU. So, that's something that I noticed is the secondary isn't as good as it was last year. Uh, the receivers aren't that good as well. And Tyrod Taylor might have a down year because of a different offense. So, those are some of the things I noticed. And on the Jets side, the running game is weak, um, super weak. Uh, not the running game, not the running game. What am I thinking about? Oh, the running defense, not the running game. The run defense, um, which surprised me. Obviously, Sheldon Richardson had a huge debut with the Seahawks, especially in the running game. That was a big loss for their defensive line. He's a super talented guy. So their run defense is worse than it was last year. That's something that I noticed with the Jets. Their secondary is not very good. Um... But other than that, their offensive line is utter garbage, and the quarterback play is poor. So, and one other thing I noticed is Jermaine Curse's uh, debut. Um, you know, when you look at Jermaine Curse's career in Seattle, most of his big plays were just great throws from Russell Wilson. I mean, those were some dimes that Russ threw, right? So to see him have a the game that he did, it was either that the Buffalo Bills secondary is just that bad, or Jermaine Curse is truly a really good number two receiver. We'll find out. But again, most of the plays that Jermaine Curse made in Seattle just were great throws. Those are franchise quarterback caliber throws. Um, so yeah, that has been your Miami Dolphins podcast for this week. Let me know what you guys think about the rookie rankings. I want to hear your rookie rankings. What do you? Who are you most excited to see? for Sunday's game. Um, and remember, guys, go check out DolphinsTalk.com. Please, if you if you can, if you have, uh, if you want to, and if you can, uh, go go uh, donate to the Hurricane Irma Relief. They started a GoFundMe on DolphinsTalk.com. So that obviously is going to help out a lot of people. And I'm sure you guys, most of the pe people on the channel, or uh, the people that uh, watch this channel, are from Florida. You guys know firsthand. I don't have to tell you guys. Um, so... Uh, that is, again, um, if you guys want to, go check out the channel for more Dolphins content. And that is going to be it. I am Skag, 3 and I will see you guys in the next one.